Greetings, I'm Salvador Cordova. Welcome to the Evidence and Reasons for the Christian Faith video channel. This channel is uh, dedicated to exploring a spectrum of evidence, evidences and reasons for the Christian faith. Uh, although in the last uh, several months since its inception, I have focused the channel mostly, almost exclusively, but not quite, on creation science and intelligent design. But from the beginning, it was not my intent to be focusing exclusively on that topic. Uh, I'm pleased to announce that I have just heard that I have been nominated as the number one YouTube creationist by um, a panel organized at Dabber Dino's channel. But I'd like to uh, say now that I'm, I'm extending, and I've always intended to <clears throat> go beyond just creation science and intelligent design as I believe the intelligent designer is the Christian God. So part of uh, some of the reasons and evidences that I'll explore, uh, in this case reasons, is uh, looking at other worldviews. If other worldviews, such as atheism, have inherently contradictions, self-contradictions, or basically a dead end, uh, by dead end I mean uh, a worldview that has little to no hope, then it may inspire some of us, as it did me 20 years ago when I nearly left the Christian faith, to consider, to reconsider in my case, to reconsider the, the Christian worldview, that uh, to entertain the possibility that it could be true. Because uh, at that point I decided in my life, uh, if atheism has no hope, um, maybe I'll consider a worldview that might offer hope that also and more importantly, actually might be true. It says in, I believe, uh, one of the epistles to the Corinthians, chapter 15, verse 32, if, uh, if the dead are not raised, um, the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And um, I concluded early on that I'm not, I have, I have little desire to, uh, try to find hope in the atheist worldview. Uh, if I were gonna, if I accepted that view, I probably would just, uh, just try to live out my life as painlessly as possible. Um, and, and um, but I didn't decide to do that. I decided to pursue evidence and reasons for the Christian faith. So with this in mind, uh, rather than me just rambling on here, I'd like to share a, a Christian testimony of someone who got uh, who, who converted from atheism to Christianity, and uh, furthermore, uh, she used she had some very interesting um, insights in the process. Her name is Dr. Sarah Stonebreaker. <clears throat> her testimony, her Christian testimony, is on the Veritas forum, and I'm going to link to it in the in the uh, video description. Of course, you may ask, well, why don't I just give a link to that? Uh, part of the reason is that it's just more fun to do a reading of these things. And uh, it's nice to also have, uh, to premiere a video uh, of these readings and uh, enjoy the, uh, the fellowship of a live chat. So with that, this is Sarah uh, Irving Stonebreaker in her own words in an article she wrote for the Veritas Forum, May 22, 2017. The title of her uh, article is How Oxford and Peter Singer Drove Me from Atheism to Jesus. I grew up in Australia in a loving secular home and arrived at Sydney University as a critic of religion. I didn't need faith to ground my identity or my values. I knew from the age of eight that I wanted to study history at Cambridge and become a historian. My identity lay in academic achievement, and my secular humanism was based on self-evident truths. As an undergrad, I won the university medal and a Commonwealth scholarship to undertake my PhD in history at King's College, Cambridge. King's is known for its secular ideology, and my perception of Christianity fitted well 
with the views of my fellow students. Christians were anti-intellectual and self-righteous. <clears throat> After Cambridge, I was elected to a junior research fellowship at Oxford. There, I attended three guest lectures by world-class philosopher and atheist public intellectual Peter Singer. Singer recognized that philosophy faces a vexing problem in relation to the issue of human worth. The natural world yields no egalitarian picture of human capacities. What about, what about the child whose disabilities or illness compromises her abilities to reason? Yet without reference to some set of capacities as the basis of human worth, the intrinsic value of all human beings become, becomes an ungrounded assertion a premise which needs to be agreed upon before any conversation can take place. I remember leaving Singer's lectures with a strange intellectual vertigo. I was committed to believing that universal human value was more than just a well-meaning conceit of liberalism, but I knew from my own research in the history of European empires and their encounters with indigenous cultures that societies have always had different conceptions of human worth or lack thereof. The premise of hum human equality is not a self-evident truth. It is profoundly historically contingent. I began to realize that the implications of my atheism were incompatible with almost every value I held dear. One afternoon, I noticed that my usual desk in the college library was in front of the theology section. With an awkward but humble reluctance, I opened a book of sermons by philosopher and theologian Paul Tillich. As I read, I was struck how intellectually compelling, complex, and profound the gospel was. I was attracted, but I wasn't convinced. <clears throat> a few months later, near the end of my time at Oxford, I was invited to a dinner for the International Society for the Study of Science and Religion. I sat next to Professor Andrew Briggs, a professor of nanomaterials who happened to be a Christian. During dinner, Briggs asked me whether I believed in God. I fumbled. Perhaps I was an agnostic? Perhaps I was an agnostic? He responded, do you really want to sit on the fence forever? That question made me realize that if issues about human value and ethics mattered to me, the response that perhaps there was a God, or perhaps there wasn't, was unsatisfactory. <clears throat> In the summer of 2008, I began a new job as assistant professor at Florida State University, where I continued my research examining the relationship between the history of science Christianity and political thought. With the freedom of being an outsider to American culture, I was able to see an active Christianity in people who lived their lives guided by the gospel, feeding the homeless every week, running community centers, and housing and advocating for migrant farm laborers. One Sunday shortly before my 28th birthday, I walked into a church for the first time as someone earnestly seeking God. Before long, I found myself overwhelmed. At last, I was fully known and seen, and I realized unconditionally loved. Perhaps I had a sense of relief from no longer running from God. A friend gave me C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity, and one night, after a couple of months of attending church, I knelt in my closet in my apartment and asked Jesus to save me and to become the Lord of my life. From there, I started a rigorous diet of theology, reading the Bible and exploring theologians such as Reinhold Niebuhr, Paul Ramsey, and F.D. Maurice. Christianity, it turned out, looked nothing like the caricature I once held. I found the story of Jacob wrestling with God especially compelling. God wants anything but the unthinking faith I had once assumed characterized Christianity. God wants us to wrestle with him, to struggle through doubt and faith, sorrow and hope. Moreover, God wants broken people, not self-righteous ones. And salvation is not about us earning our way to some place in the clouds through good works. On the contrary, 
there is nothing we can do to reconcile ourselves to God. As a, histor as a historian, this made profound sense to me. I was too aware of the cycles of poverty, violence, and injustice in human history to think that some utopian design of our own, scientific or, or otherwise, might save us. Christianity, Christianity was also, to my surprise, radical, far more radical than the leftist ideologies with which I had previously been enamored. The love of God was, like any, was unlike anything which I expected or of which I could make sense. In becoming fully human in Jesus, God behaved decidedly unlike a God. Why deign to walk through death's dark valley or hold the weeping limbs of lepers if you were God, why submit to humiliation and death on a cross in order to save those who hate you? God suffered punishment in our place because of a radical love. This sacrificial love is utterly opposed to, indivi to the individualism, consumerism, exploitation, and objectification of our culture. Just as radical, I realized, was the new creation which Christ began to initiate. This turned on its head the sentimental caricature of heaven I'd once held as an atheist. I learned that Jesus' resurrection initiated the kingdom of God, which will bring good news to the poor, release the captives, restore sight to the blind, free the oppressed. Luke 4.18 To live as a Christian is a call to be part of this new radical creation. I'm not passively awaiting a place in the clouds. I am redeemed by Christ, so now I have work to do. With God's grace, I've been elected to serve in whatever way God sees fit to build for his kingdom. We have a sure hope that God is transforming this broken, unjust world into Christ's kingdom, the new creation. And that's the end of the article. I hope you've enjoyed it, and thank you for joining um, me today in this reading of uh, Sarah Irving Stonebreaker's testimony. Take care, and God bless you.